Okay, sorry. So my name is Jamie Ryan. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at uh, Queen's University, uh, and I'm a settler scholar and uninvited guest on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe people. Uh, my talk today is called The Difference of Utopias, the Gendered Traditions of Men's and Women's Hockey Utopias. Um, so to begin, it's not controversial to say that nostalgia is a fundamental aspect of hockey culture since the entanglement of the two has been well documented for quite some time. Um, hockey scholars um, Richard Grinnell and David Whiteson note that cultural critic, critics, quote, tended to romanticize the game as it existed in the past and compare this idealized past with the apparent corruption of the present, end quote. While journalist Don Gilmore writes, quote, nostalgia has always been a necessary commodity in hockey literature, end quote. In fact, the birth of, critical ho of the critical hockey field began from a nostalgic viewpoint. Bruce Kidd and John McFarland's The Death of Hockey is generally considered the first book length example of critical hockey literature, and their nostalgia is quite obvious in the title. In other words, nostalgia permeates cultural conversations about hockey, as Grunow and Whitson note, creative hockey literature, as Gilmore notes, and critical hockey literature, um, as Kidd and McFarland point out. So again, it's not controversial to say nostalgia is a fundamental aspect of hockey culture, but at the same time, this statement ignores and erases the histories and identities of what people, um, uh, the histories and identities of people and players who are not straight, able-bodied, white, masculine men, or what I term hockey normative. Hockey normativity is the assumption that when hockey is discussed or imagined, people are talking about straight, white, able-bodied masculine men, which thereby normalizes a national whiteness, heterosexuality, and male subject. The histories of creative texts um, of women's hockey, black hockey, queer hockey, indigenous hockey, South Asian hockey, or anyone outside of hockey normativity is not nostalgic. It can't be. What time would these different orientations and histories of hockey be nostalgic for? A more fitting statement is that nostalgia is a fundamental aspect of white men and white hockey culture. And in today's paper, I will detail how creative women's hockey narratives are generally not nostalgic and in fact often work against several assumed and accepted claims in hockey scholarship. The central claim of my paper is that white men's hockey literature tends to be nostalgic and locate utopia in the past, whereas white women's hockey literature tends to focus on potentialities that locate and extend into a utopia in the future. However, women's hockey literature does not ignore the past. Instead, women's hockey productively addresses the absences in hockey history to imagine any sites as possibilities for what women's hockey could be. To start, Nostalgia is a central tenet in most popular hockey films like Young Blood, Goon, Miracle, Slapshot. However, Goon and Slapshot are perhaps the two clearest examples of hockey nostalgia. 2011's Goon is a love letter as well as a swan song to old school hockey enforcers and their dwindling importance in the modern style of play. Goon is arguably the most recent film addition to the hockey literary canon, if such a canon exists, while 1977 Slapshot is arguably the beginning of the popular hockey film genre. But despite being the first important hockey film, Slapshot is already looking back to a previous era of hockey while critiquing the present. Slapshot humorously parries the violent hockey style of the 1970s and the Broad Street Bullies, while romanticizing what the film calls, quote, old time hockey, end quote, which based on references indicates the 1920s and 30s. Additionally, nostalgia is a dominant theme in most popular culture or most popular hockey novels, particularly through the figure of the aged hockey hero who cannot get over his past glory in novels like Bill Gaston's The Good Body, Rory McGregor's The Last Season, and Paul Carrington's King Leary. However, these characters longing for the old time hockey of their youth is not just nostalgia, but also where utopia is located in white men's creative hockey texts. I realize that to talk about the intersections of utopia and hockey may seem strange, but most men's hockey texts go beyond simple nostalgia into the implicitly utopian. This utopianism can sometimes be hard to spot because of the vision of utopian men's hockey is quite conservative and rooted in traditional notions of masculinity. In The Future of Nostalgia, Svetlana Baum writes, quote, obviously any nostalgia has a utopian element, end quote. 
uh, while literary hockey scholar Jason Blake similarly notes, quote, the utopian assumption is a paradigm for most hockey fiction, end quote. In his book, Canadian Hockey Literature, Blake classifies pond hockey as the clearest example of utopia in hockey literature because of the pond's connection to childhood, innocence, and notions of play, which he derives from Bernard Suit's work. Blake's book is about hockey novels, but his claim that pond hockey is utopian is also quite noticeable in several hockey films, such as Mystery Alaska or The Mighty Ducks. All this is to say that white men's creative hockey texts are nostalgic and locate utopia in the past, more often on the ponds of childhood memory. However, this hockey utopianism is quite restrictive and excludes large portions of Canada, which sports sociologist Mary Louise Adams aptly captures when she writes, quote, narratives about hockey help keep whiteness central to dominant notions of Canadian identities. These are narratives that evoke small town and rural Canada. Canada at its whitest, end quote, and also where these utopian ponds are most often located. However, women's hockey narratives do not locate utopia in the past and more often do not locate, locate utopia on ponds for the simple fact that many girls were not welcome in boys' games of hockey. Sports sociologist Carly Adams writes, quote, historically the attempts of girls and women to enter the sacred territory of hockey have been viewed with derision, end quote. Moreover, based on her ethnographic research in 2007 and 2008, Ann Hartman notes how men at ponds and outdoor hockey rinks were often fiercely sexist and homophobic towards women. Because of the histories of sexism, homophobia, discrimination, and exclusion, there really isn't a time for women to be nostalgic for when it comes to hockey. In other words, despite women's hockey dating back to the late 19th century, women's hockey did not really become visible or popular until the 1990s, and so there's very little history to be nostalgic for especially since most of the history isn't truly common knowledge. Women's hockey and its narratives quite often overturn or work against the critical scholarship on hockey culture, particularly the work of Canadian hockey literature. And in the creative women's hockey field, utopia is most often located in the future. There are many instances of utopia in uh, women's hockey narratives, but because of time, I'm going to specifically focus on the utopian dream of professional women's hockey league and its appearing in two, in two texts, 2004's uh, Chicks with Sticks, also known as Hockey Mom, uh, which is a women's hockey film that ends with the formation of a professional women's hockey league that could pay its players. Similarly, Judith Algwer's 1995 lesbian romance novel, Iced, imagines a, a successful professional women's hockey league um, both of these texts uh, imagine something that has never happened in North America, women hockey payers being paid a livable wage in a professional league. Um, there have only been two professional women's hockey leagues in North America that have been able to pay their players, the National Women's Hockey League, NWHL, which was formed in 2015, and the Canadian Women's Hockey League, sub CWHL, which began paying their players in 2017. It may not seem like much that Chicks with Sticks and Iced fictionalize something as simple as a professional women's hockey league, uh, but that's precisely the point. It doesn't seem like much. These texts are anticipating a very simple and attainable goal that they believed was just on the horizon and just out of reach. Moreover, these works should not be treated as simply a mode of fantastical escapism because they imagine something that has never been done. But as queer theorist Jose Esteban Munoz writes, quote, but instead of a blueprint for alternative modes of being in the world, um, as escape itself needs not be a surrender, but instead be more like a refusal of a dominant order and its systematic violence, end quote. These texts are a refusal of a dominant order that has only ever told women they will fail and that hockey belongs to men. My paper has been focusing on utopian fictitious representations like hockey films and novels, but I would also like to acknowledge um, the implicit utopian longings of hockey in the real world through the men's Stanley Cup playoffs and professional women's hockey players. Uh, the Stanley Cup is currently going on right now and the nostalgia is quite often implicit. Um, but focusing on uh, the PWHPA or the Professional Women's Hockey Players Association, uh, which is a group of 200 players that decide to sit out the 2019-2020 season, um, is enacting something that Al Guerre imagined 25 years ago. Members of the PWHPA um, 
can be read as a utopian movement that is rejecting the here and now of the WNHL and working towards a then and there of some future league. Utopianism is already infused into the current struggle surrounding women's professional hockey. It's just not termed as such. Uh, and so to conclude, Munoz notes queer futurity is, quote, a utopia that understands its time is reaching beyond some nostalgic past that perhaps never was or some future whose arrival is continuously belated, a utopia in the present. Um, utopia is the major discourse of men's hockey. Um, which is situated in the past, but for women's hockey, utopia is distinctly and perhaps necessarily in the future, but a future drawn from yet resistant to the present. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I'm muted. Very professional there as the host. Um, so next up, we have Rachel Bishop from the University of Western Ontario. Okay, um, share screen. Okay, sure, yep. Okay, perfect. Um, let's show. Okay. All right, um, yeah, so just before I start, um, I just like to uh, also recognize that I'm on the traditional, I'm in Toronto, I'm on the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the New Credit the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabek, and the Huron-Wendat, and that I'm also a, an uninvited settler on their land. And my co-presenter, uh, Dr. Angela Schneider, is unable to make it today. She has a medical appointment, so I'll be hopefully doing justice to her to her parts. Um, so yeah, my name is Rachel Bishop. I'm a former competitive hockey goalie in the greater Toronto area, so I've always been interested in hockey ever since I was six. Played High, pretty high level for about um, 10 years. And then I also just played house league before that and then did intramurals at university. Um, so that kind of sparked my interest in this topic. This is actually taken from my master's thesis. It's a different title than what's on your program. But anyway. And Angela Schneider is a former gold, uh, former silver medalist uh, Olympian in rowing in the 1994 Olympics. So Gender issues have stirred debate in hockey for almost 50 years. And the modern genesis of this is traceable to the unofficial Russian hockey anthem, which is called No Coward Plays Hockey, which as you notice is the title of my presentation, which is taken from my master's thesis that I did two years ago. And this song, No Coward Plays Hockey, was written during the Cold War era and was made popular during the 1972 Canada-Russia Summit Series. Now this series is notable because it was the first best on best hockey tournament that NHLers had competed in. Of course, um, they weren't in the Olympics at that time. They were only, only been in the Olympics since 1998 until that time was only amateurs. So this is really the first time that we had a chance to see Canada's best versus the other best in the world, the Soviets go head to head in a tournament. Uh, this series is also notable because it featured extreme violence and mutual disregard, and of course happened during the Cold War as well. Um, but the violence and mutual disregard actually kind of stems from a vicious attack from star Hockey Hall of Famer, Canadian forward Bobby Clark, when he um, knocked his, knocked, put his stick over the ankle of star Soviet forward Valery Karlamov, knocking Karlamov out for the tournament and breaking his ankle as a result. Now, this was in the sixth game of the series, and it was seen as a turning point in the eighth game, in the eight game series that Canada would, of course, go on to win in overtime of the eighth game. Everyone knows that Paul Henderson goals kind of ingrained in Canadian folklore. Um, but despite the fact that the team comprising Canadian NHL, Canadian NHL All-Stars resorted to violence in order to win the series, um, it was the Soviet team that was viewed in a more negative light in North America, even though the Soviets were clearly more talented and somewhat less violent uh, than the Canadians. And in fact, the Canadians didn't even receive any public support until they resorted to these violent tactics in order to win. Thinking back to when they were booed off the ice in Winnipeg in game four, then they decided to play violent and they got the overwhelming support of the country. They were even celebrated as heroes in the Canadian media, media, which is a perfect example of no coward plays hockey, meaning that it's a sport for only the most masculine and dominant of men. 
One example that I took to for my uh, analysis for my master's was an ethical and philosophical analysis, specifically looking at utilitarianism and liberty. So John Stuart Mill, the famed philosopher, believed in the concept of liberty. So the idea of free will, which this is the opposite of paternalism. Um, and the modern day philosopher, the late Robert Simon, interpreted Mill's concept of paternalism as interference with the liberty of agents for what is believed to be people's own good. So, for example, this is the idea of mandatory seatbelt laws in 49 US states and across Canada. But Mill did say that paternalism was only acceptable when others are at direct risk of being harmed. Now, this is called the harm principle, and this is the argument that the NHL endorses. But the paternalist argument states that it doesn't matter if others are at risk of being harmed, you should do it because it's for your own good as well. And this is the argument that Robert Simon and Hockey Hall of Fame goaltender Ken Dryden support. And they this would mean that they want a complete ban on all headshots in the NHL due to potential permanent brain damage. Now, it's important to note that by headshots, I mean any in in incident where the head is a principal point of contact, regardless if it's accidental or on purpose. Um, so that's what I mean by that. But the other argument where related to hockey where Mill says paternalistic interference is justified is when um, you're dealing with the mentally incompetent or with children. So one can argue, for example, I would argue at least that a player who receives multiple blows to the head as a result of, uh, as a result of concussions caused by aggressive violence in hockey loses brain capacity and therefore is mentally incompetent. And that's according to Mill, paternalistic interference should, should apply. So the continuing on with this approach, um, relating this to women's hockey, women's hockey organizations and leagues, as well as international hockey, already take a paternalistic view. Of course, in women's hockey, there's no body checking and thus no fighting is allowed. And notably, the International Ice Hockey Federation does not permit fighting in men's hockey, neither does NCAA and U Sports. And as a result, there's no aggressive violence or fighting at the Olympics or World Hockey Championships, regardless of gender. Another example, another area of research that I took to look at this issue was the idea of uh, gender and ethics in women's hockey, specifically in with some social culture constructs. So Leslie Howe, who's a philosophy professor from University of Saskatchewan, claims that tradition tells us that women exist primarily to look attractive. And she argues that the mere presence of the female athlete turns these constructs upside down. How embodies that athletic women embody strength, and as a result, they are blow to the male ego and are therefore confusing to male identity. Thus, we need to change the way we think about female athletes, especially those playing traditional male sports, such as hockey. And I would say hockey really at its very core epitomizes hegemonic masculinity. Now this concept's come up a lot. This is a quintessential example of manhood. Just to reiterate what hegemonic masculinity is, it was a concept developed by famed Australian sociologist R.W. Connell. She defines hegemonic masculinity as a concept that is identified by the dominant alpha male in society. So the norm, a practice that supports the complete subordination of femininity and feminine qualities and hegemonic masculinity in and of itself is taken from um, Italian Marxist philosopher slash sociologist Antonio Gramsci and his theory of hegemony or hegemony, which he wrote about during the era of Italian fascism relating that to, to politics and Mussolini. Uh, again, Mary Louise Adams here, a great quote from her, I think really kind of sums up hockey in Canada and this issue. She writes, if hockey is life in Canada, then Canada remains decidedly masculine and white. So meaning that it is ironic that hockey is a national winter sport as the sport is not representative of Canada as a nation at all. Just thinking um, about where I am in Toronto, 51% of the residents are born outside of Canada. Toronto is considered the most diverse city in the world. In addition, 50 over 50% of Canada is female. So knowing these stats, we really cannot say hockey is representative of the nation. Another area that I looked at is the idea of gender and sex segregation in sport. Um, and Torben Chanzo, who's a Swedish philosophy professor, claims that the very notion of having different rules in sports for men and women is sexist and discriminatory. And he states that gender segregation in sports should not exist 
and believes that every sport should be co-ed and with the same rules. Now, my co-presenter, Angela Schneider, who's a gender and ethics scholar, she totally dispels Chanzo and ultimately says his ideal is not realistic. She claims that women would actually be left out in the cold and gender equality would never exist in the Olympics. Just thinking back to Tokyo, well, thinking forward to Tokyo, I believe this is the first Olympics where it's going to be 50% uh, males and females in terms of uh, gender equality, which is great because they're adding more disciplines for women's sports. If we have this rule, we never have men, we never have an equal amount of men and women playing hockey. Uh, if we never have an equal amount because they're subscribed to the male view, so we only have about 20%. And then as a result, there's fewer women, fewer women are being talked about in the media, and there's way fewer for role models, and as a result, fewer girls will, will take up sports. So she argues that this is counterproductive, and moreover, some, some, some women might not want to compete against men, and ultimately, I agree with her opinion as well. I don't think it's realistic. I think it's idealistic. She goes on to say it is considered normal for men and abnormal for women to engage in violence and that the integration of males and females playing together means that women might have to accept male ideals that are not their own. And in contrast, the separation of men and women in sport with different rules means that females can create her own values and own belief systems within the field of play. For example, and here I used to have body checking women's hockey, but it was eliminated in 1950. Subsequently, the International Ice Hockey Federation eliminated it from um, the, for the 1990 Women's World Hockey Championship. The rationale for this decision was so that less skilled and weaker teams had more of a chance against most dominant women's hockey nations, namely Canada and the United States. And in making this decision, the double IHF hoped to create more parity and make international women's hockey more competitive and in addition with gender generating more interest because ethically as Schneider saying, the public feels uncomfortable watching women use physical violence and how argues that this gender segregation in hockey and rule difference, you no know, body checking means that women's hockey has its own ideal. There's an emphasis on skill over force and playmaking over, over violence and many tactics. Hockey is the only team sport that consists of different rules for men and women for example, American football and rugby, which are two traditionally masculine sports, so equally intense and physical in both the men's and women's game. So as a result, some scholars argue it is unreasonable to state that, a reason to argue that female hockey players ill-equipped to handle the same form of physicality as men. And thanks to its long-standing reputation as a physical and violent sport dating back over 100 years, and the fact that the NHL is the only major North American sports league to tolerate fighting, it is hard for hockey traditionalists to see the sport in any other way. Because of this, one can claim that hockey retreats from challenging gender norms and supports hegemonic masculinity. As I mentioned, not only is... So, hockey... Sorry, could we just kind of wrap it up? This is all great. We're well, just don't, I have, time. don't I have 15 minutes? 10, sorry, because we have four people. Uh, I, I was told that it was 50. Uh, the program said it's 15 if you're two and 20 if you're one. I was told 10 if you're four. Uh, that's not what the program told me at all. Sorry. So I, I've been preparing for 15 because the, and everyone else who's gone who's been one has been 20. Yesterday they had people that were one that were 20. Yeah, but it's, um, like if three people are in a session, it's 15. If four are in a session, like we have, it's 10. I thought that was, a no, I think it's a four in one group together. Okay, well, I, I thought I had 15 minutes. Sorry. Um, I mean, okay. it's okay, because there's no session after this. So we can go a bit over time. Okay, um, well, I'm almost done anyway. Okay. okay so, um, not to mention that the NHL is the only, not to mention hockey is the only league that um, permits uh, fighting. It's not even just a hockey issue, it's an NHL issue. So the NHL itself is the only professional hockey league that promotes and sells hate. Professional, North, uh, professional European leagues do not permit fighting. And these European players are often seen as soft as a result because they don't subscribe to these traditional North American values. Critics of fighting and headshots are told to watch women's hockey or figure skating. But ironically enough, the most watched hockey games in Canada are those at the Olympics, which is a tournament that did not permit fighting. But still, the overarching belief in the hockey world is that the fighting and aggressive violence in sport are what make it a man's game. And essentially, those who do not support the culture of violence that the NHL promotes are told they're not manly enough to watch NHL hockey. Thus, the traditional hockey fan would argue those who support paternalism 
are supporting a pussified version of a masculine sport. And how does this relate to women's hockey? Well, the general consensus is that it's negative and it's not truly hockey because it does not include body checking and fighting. So to conclude, this presentation examined how the male hockey establishment and the general public sees female hockey players as lesser athletes. Furthermore, this presentation also contributed to the academic and popular discussion hydromotic masculinity by examining the rule differences between men's hockey and women's hockey. This presentation also examines the pros and cons of gender integration and segregation in sports, and ultimately why I think males and females should not play sports together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Kristen Morrison from Laurentian. Sorry, just taking a second to load here. There we go. I think we're good. Everyone can see that. Okay, so today I will be uh, presenting on my um, thesis research, uh, my master's thesis research, and I'll be giving a very quick overview. So it's entitled Beyond the Blue Line, How Competitive Male Ice Hockey Players in uh, Ontario Construct Their Identities. And I'd first like to acknowledge, um, because I am at Laurentian University, which is in Sudbury, Ontario, and we are on the traditional lands of um, Atek Mekshing Anishinaabek. So to start with a bit of um, literature that helped inform my study, uh, sport has been around for hundreds of years, we know that, and it's been a source of entertainment and a source of entertainment to particularly showcase power and dominance. There's many positives to sports, such as improved health, um, character building, developing friendships, but there's also some negatives to sport as well, such as a win-at-all-cost mentality, um, violence, and uh, toughness. In 1968, um, Erickson defined identity as an ever-changing sense of who one is, both on an individual level and as a member of society. And he also postulated that um, identity cannot be removed from culture. Now, a major component of identity is salience. And this is, refers to the importance or prominence of a identity within a particular context. So the more salient the identity, the more that identity will be demonstrated across multiple contexts. Uh, identities are of particular interest in sports literature because um, the effect that sporting experiences can have on constructing identities. Athletic identity is heavily used within identity sport literature and is defined as the degree to which an individual identifies with an athlete role. Carlos and Douglas are highly referenced within uh, identity sport research and found that sport culture shapes psychological processes of identity development. And as we've seen throughout this uh, conference and as well, especially in this session, that masculinity has been an integral part of sport culture with male sports such as hockey being highly studied as a place for the reproduction of problematic masculinities. Um, and hockey is a site where men learn certain masculine values, relations, and rituals. Elaine and McDonald, those two researchers who have significantly contributed to the hockey masculinity research, and especially in regards to stereotypes and how players act both on and off the ice. And finally, hockey and hypermasculinity are highly valued in Canadian culture and are as seen as part of our national identity. So this leads me to my research question, which is how do competitive male ice hockey players in Northeastern Ontario construct their identities through sport participation? So to start uh, my theoretical framework, I started with a social constructionism paradigm, um, which is essentially meanings are made instead of, uh, instead of discovered and everything important in the world is socially constructed through our interactions with each other. And I also followed, uh, use the narrative identity theory to inform my study. And this conceptualizes identity as a cultural construction rather than a trait line within an individual. 
And it also uh, can be used to show the intricacy of human life while providing insight into how individuals construct their identity. So for my recruitment of the study, um, I was hoping to recruit from four teams within Northeastern Ontario, which were at the OUA level, the OHL and the junior A level. And um, this may have been the toughest part of my research, but hopefully maybe someone can ask questions about that later. So essentially I was able to get six participants. Um, five of them were current hockey players within those three hockey teams. And as well as I implemented using a key informant. And so that was a former professional hockey player who's now um, a huge advocate for LGBTQ community, both in and out of the uh, sports world. For my data collection, I used um, semi-structured conversational interviews. So really tried to keep them open-ended, but because this was my first time doing interviews, I wanted to keep somewhat of a little bit of structure just to make sure that I kept on task and was answering, hopefully answering my research questions. For my data analysis, I used reflexive thematic analysis by Brown and Clark, which followed the six steps of coding and developing themes. And then finally, a large part of my research was my reflexivity. And this, unfortunately, I won't have time to delve into. Um, but essentially, because I am a female going into research, a very male dominated space, as well as an outsider to the hockey community, um, my positionalities as a researcher really had an effect throughout the whole research project from what I wanted to research to my interviews to my data analysis. So for my results, I had three major themes that I developed. Um, the first one, influence of others, which had three sub-themes. The second one, what it means to be a hockey player with two sub-themes. And finally, building a new identity, which was just a standalone overarching theme. So for the first theme, the um, influence of others, this one really encompassed the people that um, the participants felt most influenced them and who they kind of spent the most time with. So the first one is the influence of coaches. So they were seen as um, secondary to parents as the most influential in their lives, both in a positive and a negative light. So Michael says, you get coaches that drive you away from wanting to do something. They make you not like the game. And then on the other hand, you have Jack who says, the coaches really helped me become who I am today in terms of preparation, in terms of just standards, in terms of how I conduct myself off the ice. Then we have the brotherhood and this theme um, encompassed the feelings about teammates. So Marcus says, so I feel like how the older guys like the identity of the team kind of shapes how younger guys do things in the team, I guess. And then we have um, being in the public eye. So this sub theme uh, included the influence of fans and society, both in a positive and a negative light. So we have Oliver, who's the key informant saying, you know, because it's so ingrained in our culture and such a big part of Canadian culture, the hockey culture is given a pass and almost celebrated and almost been taken into work culture and different cultures in our society. And then we have John who says, uh, people know who you are. And if they see you being an idiot and driving like an idiot or swearing out in public, then they're going to think all these guys are like that. And it puts a bad rap on the organization and hockey players in general. So the second theme of what it means to be a hockey player and this theme encompassed the feelings of the specific kind of attributes that came with being a hockey player as opposed to outside of the hockey community. So learning to make your way was this first sub theme. Um, and Michael talks about uh, growing up as a hockey player saying you grow up really quick, you're with a family but they don't do everything the same way your family does. You really gain your independence. Bouncing around, you really get to learn how different people interact with each other. So you get a bunch of different uh, personalities and you learn how to make your way. And then we have John speaking about kind of uh, being at a more competitive level and having little kids look up to him. So he says, you're kind of like someone they look up to and they kind of idolize you. I don't like saying that, but that's kind of how it is. Like people look up to us and especially younger kids. And then we have the second sub theme, which is more than just a hockey player. And this theme really spoke to the stereotypes in hockey and how participants felt about stereotypes and whether they kind of felt they fit into that um, stereotypical image of a hockey player or not. 
Um, so we have Michael saying there's that stereotype around hockey players. You're just not a regular person. You're not a regular member of society. It's like they expect you to be mean or they expect you to be cocky or have some sort of arrogance or not be intelligent or that kind of thing. And then we have Jack who kind of stepped away from um, the stereotypical image of a hockey player trying to, to kind of go out on his own saying, so I try to make it less of a priority in my life when I'm introducing myself because I feel like I'm more than just hockey, which is why I don't really bring it up that much to some people, some new people that I meet. I just want them to know who I really am and not base themselves on maybe some stereotypes. They might think, oh, I play hockey. I follow this rule of hockey players. And so the last theme is building a new identity. And this theme encompassed um, participants' feelings of who they are as a hockey player, um, their goals as a hockey player, and their goals outside of hockey. So we first have Marcus, who um, really just wants to continue with hockey. And he says, kind of take hockey as far as I can, live that out. And then first job, I think, kind of like doing something like firefighting, policing, something like that. And there's a lot of good connections to hockey and stuff like that into those jobs. So yeah, I think that would be good. And then the second one is from Jack, who actually believes that they're at their tail end is ready to move on from hockey. And he says, I think I'm at the tail end of my career. I'll be honest, it's been a great run, but I think school is more important at this stage of my career. So I think focusing on different interests, you can build a new identity as a person. And I think it's at the stage of my career where I need to start focusing on my career because hockey doesn't last forever, even if you're playing in the NHL. So back to the research question, how did I answer it? We see that participants uh, constructed their identities through the interaction they, that they spend the most time with, their level of athletic identity, the time they spend devoting to other activities outside of hockey, specific attributes of hockey life and stereotypes within hockey. So the implications of my study, um, the study helped to push to help athletes develop identities outside of hockey, to understand the complexity of athlete identities that they're not all the same. And finally, that it should hopefully help to change the value placed on certain characteristics. Thank you and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. And next we have Teresa Ann Fowler from the Concordia University of Edmonton. Okay, Brett, can you just confirm for me that you can see the actual presentation? I'm assuming yes, and you can't see my notes. Okay. Oh, we can, I can see your notes, the presenter. You view. can see my notes? Yeah. Okay, then I'm just going to change, sorry. Yeah, just let me know if you can, oh, there it is. There, how's it? Yeah, that? that's good. Perfect, thank you. Now I need to move this thing over here. So thank you so much for um, my fellow presenters today and their topics. Um, this presentation is going to highlight findings from a paper which is published in the Sociology of Sport Journal. Um, today I'm focusing on the images not the theory, which I do draw from Burdue's cultural reproduction in the paper. And if you can't access the paper, you're welcome to email me um, and I'll, I'll be happy to send it to you. So my name is Dr. Teresa Ann Fowler. I'm currently living outside of Mokinsis, also known as Calgary, and I'm an assistant professor of education um, at the Concordia University of Edmonton, located in Beaver Hills House, also known as Edmonton. Images have a way of speaking to our souls and reveal moments to which we may have presently been unaware of. This image of my aunts and I reads differently now, looking back. My younger aunt in the stroller, she tells me in this photo that she felt lost whereas I had a relentless desire to be one of them, a sister. So I always hung off of my older aunt everywhere she went. Susan Sontag states that photographs are evidence not only of what's there, but of what an individual sees, not just a record, but of the world. Since the Vietnam War, 
Photography has brought into our consciousness happenings around the world, and once seen, we can no longer unsee. This image of an indigenous water protector humbly kneel before white male RCMP officers with their guns and armor really provokes us to question who and what are worth protecting. And just a heads up that the next image you might find disturbing. This photograph of three-year-old Alan Curdy's lifeless body washed up on a Turkish beach and it shocked the world in 2015. However, it also prompted a response. When the world saw the body of this young boy discarded like a piece of trash, that humanized the Syrian refugee crisis. Without images, as Sontag writes, we re reality remains hidden from us. But do we remain voyeurs? Or does photography provoke us to call into question what we did not see before and act? This image of Fort Kiapel Indian Residential School shows families of different nations who made a camp, the mandated distance away from their children near the school so that the families could look over their children and so their children knew they were not alone. And then what do we see in this image? So what happens when we ask young hockey players to use photography to describe their experiences in this study, what these images revealed was the ways in which an entrenchment of the hockey boy identity in schools perpetuates hypermasculine uh, traits and the harm that is also building within these young male athletes. Participants in this study engaged in photography to express their feelings in schools and together they discussed the images. What emerged was the weight of the hypermasculine narratives, including toughness, homophobia, sexism and classism grafted onto these boys, as well as the implications on their mental health being in an isolated and exclusive white cis heteronormative community. Young athletes desiring to continue to play elite hockey find themselves becoming both producers and products of hypermasculine narratives further ensconing hypermasculinity within, hyper, within hockey culture. So there were five boys who participated in this study and they were asked to take pictures during, during their day-to-day -day lives in school regarding their experiences. Each week over the course of three months, the boys took pictures and then we together discussed the images. So today I'll share some of their images, which presents a stark contrast to how I as an educator see hockey boys in school. And my hope is that these images compel us to begin to question the impact of hockey culture on young boys who are often living away from home, isolated, and often with age gaps that span adolescence into adulthood. We begin first with how they learn best in school. Johnny liked having motivational quotes and being organized. Lightning McQueen also liked being prepared and Simba compartmentalized what he needed to do as seen in this eco center picture. Wolverine preferred being busy and doing his learning. Participants also identified as disengaged from school. They only saw a purpose in school that arose from pressures from their families to do well, as well as a plan B to hockey. And as well, their coaches had um, certain academic expectations. The boys were enrolled in a specialized sports academy and had a schedule that supported them to play hockey and they had their own teacher attached to the team who would report to coaches if players were not maintaining an established academic level of success. So when I asked them, what do I as a teacher, what would I see when they are checked out from school? How would I know that they are disengaged? As hockey boys, they became began to attune to how they can use their hockey boy identity to mask their disenchantment. One major way was through food. Lightning McQueen said that whenever I'm not interested, I just eat. He also said when we get there, like we're all, we all eat lunch and not really do any work. And Simba said, yeah, for me, I guess it's also for hockey. I'm just trying to gain weight and get bigger so I can be big like a lot. 
Simba also recognized the ways in which teachers grafted the boys will be boys narrative on them, stating that eating in class and their goofing off was excused because they were hockey boys. Wolverine would actually calculate how much time he could sleep in class. A sleep was something all the boys spoke of was lacking in their lives due to pressures from the team and from school. Other ways the boys used their hockey identity to mask their disengagement and feelings was their excess energy as hockey players. So they were permitted to go for walks during class and run in the hallways. Also ribbing. They joked and razzed each other to the point where some were left feeling ostracized and uncomfortable. And at times the ribbing uh, was homophobic. Then we moved to their feelings and I asked them, how do they feel in school? Wolverine said he felt trapped and empty. Simba also said he felt empty and Wolverine felt chaos and overwhelmed. Johnny said he felt lonely. Simba said he needed to escape and he also felt like trash. Johnny said he felt sick. So despite the boys' ability to use their cultural capital and habitus to hide their disengagement from school, they became complicit with the reproduction of that identity. Indeed, they were conscious of doing so, at times calling their issues, quote, first world problems, which was a concerning remark giving the rise in mental health issues with young boys and men. Hypermasculinity's place in schools not only privileges male hockey players, but also provides opportunities for misrecognition and complacency by students and adults. Socially disengaging amongst um, hypermasculine unity presents and renders gender identity uniform. The hockey boys or the boys will be boys labels as implicit understandings of gender and hypermasculinity. The implicitness cannot separate from everyday life without a disruption of how we view the masculine young boy. However, when performances of power become ontological, this cultural status is a source of alienation for those who identify with this identity. Through their engagement with photography, participants found they could easily relate to each other's experiences of disengagement without having to overtly state how they were feeling. Wolverine thought that using photography to express himself was, quote, cool. You could say stuff without having to say anything. Whereas Lightning McQueen found it, quote, frustrating because he struggled to find ways to represent himself. Johnny also struggled, but then felt that using photography helped him to identify his feelings and that this moved him out of his, quote, comfort zone. He realized that he enjoyed the space to be, quote, creative and learn different skills. Simba liked using photography to express himself, saying that it felt good. And at times it is hard to, quote, put into words how he was feeling. Photography offers a means to see moments that make up a broader experience and provide ways to develop informed understandings and interventions for change. So this study revealed how hypermasculinity is reproduced in schools and assimilated and glorified in the educational milieu. Privileging hockey players in the Canadian context is a part of the fabric of our national identity, an attitude that permeates the school climate. At school, the boys in this study use their cultural capital and habitus to their benefit. What emerged, however, was the way this reproduction of power was causing harm to those on young athletic boys. The rise in mental health concerns for boys and men needs to be explicitly interrogated as boys and men are overrepresented as perpetrators of acts of violence. School stakeholders must also recognize their role in the reproduction of hypermasculinity and stop perpetuating a harmful narrative. Thank you. And there's um, my references. Thank you. Thank you. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, you can, I think the best way is probably to type them in the chat and I can read them out and share with everyone. I'd like to 
ask a question to Kristen. Um, because you said I about you know being a woman, being an outsider of hockey culture and working with these men. That was the same experience I had working with these young boys, where I ended up taking on this mother role to these young boys, and so I you know I had to work through that to find you know their voice. So I'm wondering if you could maybe speak to that a little bit about how you navigated your positionality with your study. Sure. Um... So there was a lot of conversation with my committee and a lot of reflexive thought on my part um, about who I was and kind of my part in the research. So because I was, my participants were similar age to me. So they were like early twenties, except for my key informant. Um, I kind of went in with it more of, like trying to be a, a friend, especially with like the conversational interviews, um, trying not to have as much of a, like a power dynamic um, and hoping more to just have a conversation with them. Um, but then I also had to think about how they would perceive me as a female. Um, and I don't know if there's anything that I could have done to like, mitigate that but I kind of like I thought about okay what should I wear to interviews and like how the kind of questions I'm asking and how I'm responding to questions how is that going to come across um so there was just like a lot of it was more so a lot of reflexive thought afterwards and well actually throughout it and being like okay how'd that interview go um what could I have done differently what did I do that maybe could have had an impact and then again, through my analysis stage being like, okay, who am I? Like the way I analyzed it, okay, they're the answers to the, my questions, are they answering it in a specific way because I am who I am? So I'm not sure if that answered your question, but <laughs> that was mostly my thoughts going through my head. It's kind of like a jumbled mess, but um, I think that was like a really important part of the research too. Rachel? Hi, um, I have a question for Jamie. Um, I really liked your presentation. It was really interesting. I was just wondering if you, I know you're talking about Goon and you mentioned Goon was the last movie that kind of idolized this enforcer or spoofed it in a way too. Did you look at Goon 2 at all or the sequel or a movie like Hockey to uh, Hello Destroyer, which came out more recently, small film, but it really showed the implications of hockey violence? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I do look at Goon. Uh, Goon 2 last of the enforcers quite a lot. Um, I, I'm curious to gauge it, though, because I, I know Goon is very popular, but I don't know how many people have seen Goon 2. Um, and Hello Enforcer is also a fabulous um, pickup, too. I know Brett, um, our, our moderator, also has seen it. Um, and yeah, I agree. It's a, a really great deconstruction of hockey masculinity. Um, Very different from Goon 2. Yeah. There's so, there's so Goon 2 is great. It's, it's funny. Yeah. And so I, I think um, I, I do look at them, but um, Goon 2 uh, is something I sort of, uh, I look at more in, um, I don't expect people to be at my previous talk, but it's, it's something that I look at more and how it looks at wives rather than how um, it looks at Utopia, but it does the same sort of thing where it situates Doug Glad and Ross Ray, um, their continued sort of presence in, um, in hockey is the saving grace. It's the thing that um, destroys the, the modern enforcer in the role of uh, Anders Kane. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think those are great ones. Cool. Another, you. sorry, another question for Jamie from Stacy Lawrence. Great presentation. I'm at the beginning of a project focused on Walter Gretzky as Canada's hockey dad and his role in the myth of the backyard rink. So I'm wondering how you could see Wally and his rink in terms of your view of nostalgia and utopia. Thanks. I also want to add on to that. I'm wondering if you have anything to say about what, like, how it plays in that we have nostalgia for Walter Gretzky, but we don't know, like. A similar player at the time, Mario Lemieux. I know nothing about his parents. 
a good point. Um, yeah, uh, Stacy, thank you. Um, and thank you, Rachel, for that question. That was a great question. Um, but yeah, Stacy, thank you again. And um, uh, I'm sorry to miss uh, your presentation yesterday, but I, I've, I've heard a bit of your talk about the colorblind racism. And I love that idea. I think it's a fabulous idea. Um, I, I think your project sounds fascinating um, because, yeah, it's Walter Gretzky has its own film. Um, like there's a film about like the greatest hockey player's dad. That's very strange. I, I can't think of that for anything else. Like Michael Jordan doesn't have a, a film about his dad. Um, he talks about his dad and stuff, but um, same thing with like, I don't, I don't know who you would say the best football, Tom Brady. I don't there, I don't know anything about his dad. Um, yeah, it's a very, very strange idea. And I think um, something that it sort of touches upon in, uh, I think hockey is very similar to baseball literature uh, in terms of, uh, you, you can absolutely make the argument that football is the American sport now. I, I think that's absolutely true. But I think um, baseball literature and baseball films are more um, similar to sort of how hockey literature and hockey films in Canada and their connection to sort of masculinity, nationalism, history, uh, with football not really becoming super dominant until the 70s or so. Um, and I think this sort of idea of the father and this utopian rink, it's almost this, the Canadian version of throwing catch with your dad, like your dad building the rink, um, and then passing the puck or just watching you. I've never experienced this. My, my dad never built a rink, um, but I, I think it sort of goes to this. And I think it speaks to this figure of Walter um, as this sort of parental figure of hockey in general. He's almost like the patron saint or patron father of hockey dads. Um, and uh, I, th yeah, I think it, it's really interesting too, because he's almost more of a, a, a figure than Walt Wayne Gretzky is. Wayne Gretzky ha like does pop up in films, but uh, in terms of the literature or the novels that talk about Gretzky, a lot of it um, really critiques Gretzky um, because he's a skill player or critiques his move from Edmonton to the LA Kings. Um, and yeah, so I think what you hit on and is Walter Gretzky's Canada's hockey diet, I think is fascinating. I think you hit the nail on its head. Absolutely. I can't wait to, to read it or to hear more about that. Um, thank you. I hope I answered it. I'm just really excited by this idea that you're talking about. Do we have any other questions? I think we can wrap it up. Great presentations, everyone. Learned a lot. Enjoyed every one of them. Thank you. Thanks for another good day at the conference. And see everyone tomorrow, I guess. <laughs>